Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good. Good morning to everybody on the, on the webinar this morning. Welcome to the third webinar in our series on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm Gail Letts, founder and CEO of Let's Consult, an organization dedicated to helping businesses build cultures that embrace diversity and inclusion to become stronger and better. We also provide our network of over 5,000 women with programs, resources, and connections to help them advance and grow professionally. Earlier this summer, we launched our webinar series on diversity, beginning with a conversation about race, how we can talk about challenges and divide with honesty, empathy, and a let's do better mentality. Our second webinar in the series talked about the importance of building culture over programs. Today, we're going to talk about how companies can attract, develop, and retain diverse talent. We have three fabulous panelists, and I'm sure you're going to find today's comments insightful and helpful. Throughout the program today, we'd love to hear from you and we'll do our best to answer your questions. If you do have a question, please use the chat bar at the bottom of your screen. So let me now introduce our panelists. Dr. Ethelyn McQueen Gibson serves as Associate Professor. Ethelyn, you can wave your hand so we know which one you are, thank you. Uh, Associate Professor at Hampton University's School of Nursing in Hampton, Virginia, and serves as the Director for the Center for Geriatric Excellence and Minority Aging. She holds a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from Ursuline College in Cleveland, Ohio, a Master of Science degree in Nursing from the Medical College of Virginia, of, I'm sorry, Georgia, a BS in Nursing from Ursuline. She has practiced nursing for over 35 years and she is a veteran having served as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps on active and reserve duty. Welcome, Dr. Ethelyn. Thank you. Amy Menefee is partner of, of Business Assurance and Advisory Services at Cutter CPA, and she has a unique combination of public accounting experience and internal audit experience totaling over 19 years. Prior to joining Kiter in 2019, Amy worked at Hilb, Rogel, and Hobbs providing and managing internal audit services. She graduated from VCU with a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting, magnum cum laude, and is a member of the American Society of Women Accountants, co-founder, treasurer, and vice president of Charitable Souls Foundation, and is on the finance councils for Our Lady of Lourdes Church and School. Our third panelist is Michael Thorne Beglin, Vice President of Talent and Culture and Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer for Altria. Michael has been with Altria for 16 years and he has also served as Chief Transformation Officer, Director of Brand and Trade Channel Integrity and Assistant General Counsel for the company. Michael is a graduate of the College of William and Mary where he received a bachelor's degree in political science and government and from the TC Williams School of Law. Michael serves on the board of directors for Side by Side, an organization dedicated to supporting LGBTQ youth in Central Virginia, serves on the boards for St. Catherine School, Board of Governors, I'm sorry, for St. Catherine School, and is on the board of directors for Housing Opportunities Made Equal. So let's talk. Michael, I'd like to start with you. You've been at Altria for 16 years. How have you seen the business change and adapt to the need to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Great, well, Gil, uh, thank you, first of all, and, uh, and Dr. Uh, Gibson and Amy, it's great to be with you today. Um, uh, so to go right into it, I think uh, you're right. I've been here for 16 years. I am newer to the work of inclusion, diversity, um, and difference. I, you know, I started my, my work at a large firm and then came in-house with Altria and in-house department. And I, I think like, you know, most companies, um, you know, the, what, what we have seen, particularly established companies, um, as, as the world has changed, um, as our society has changed, um, you know, we, I think, uh, relied upon, I would say, notions of how to address this work from the late 90s, early 2000s. And sort of, I think what we had built sort of brought that forward. And what I've seen, I think, particularly over the past few years, and then, it's just exploded over the past few months has been, I think, a willingness to step back from an approach to this work um, and, and come at it in a fundamentally different way. 
Um, and before we get into that, I, I think that what um, even preceded, again, the, the, the past um, few months and it was the notion that um, the, we have it on the business side, any successful business organization, you know, has ways of operating that they are comfortable with applying to core services, core business products. Um, it's what makes them successful. And I, and I think there was a traditional reticence to sort of bring this into, um, into this world. Right? People, don't, people are messy and we don't fit in a spreadsheet in the same way that numbers and uh, other aspects of this do. And so I think that before you get to, um, um, you know, a lot of other work I think has been a need to be real about um, who you are as a company and organization um, and, and be grounded in, in what that looks like. And so I think that, um, and we can talk more about it, but I, I, what, I, what I've seen is now a, while for years there was a, an acknowledgement, at least in writing, I think that increasingly, and I can see we've seen it, is a, a different commitment to a level of action that, you know, largely particularly for profit corporations um, have been less willing to, to sort of take on. You know, Michael, I, I do have a follow-up question, but one of the things that you just said really made me, um, I think of something that actually occurred yesterday. I was working with a nonprofit um, on helping them put together a job description for a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I went to their industry trade group and the representative at the industry great trade group had commented to me that um, she was struggling with getting job descriptions because in so many organizations, this is a newly created position and that people are figuring this out. And, and, and you're absolutely right, we're taking language and we're starting to put it more into action. But what that action looks like, there really hasn't been a roadmap. But what she and I agreed yesterday was we've all got to start someplace. And yeah. we recognize, and this goes a little bit to the very first conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion that we had in our series. We're all going to make some mistakes. But the most important thing is that we try and we start moving forward and we learn, we test and we learn and, and we evolve as we move through this. Um, so as a follow up to, to your comments, um, what strategies have you seen most successful so far with attracting, retaining and developing diverse talent? Yeah. So and this is what I'm alluding to. I think oftentimes we'll go right to sort of a development program or an on-campus or experienced hire approach. And I think what's most important is before we go to any of that work, we step back and as an organization, we're real about who we are. Um, and I mean that in terms of it's sort of, again, what we do on the business or as a university or as organizations, what do we excel at? What are we great at? Where are we not? And in some ways, I think we have been reticent to be rigorous about exploring who we are. And I mean both from a diversity standpoint and then a cultural standpoint. And so I mean, some companies struggle with really even getting an intersectionality and identifying that she is a lesbian of color, she is a black lesbian, he is a trans white male. He, we've, I think, stopped short of acknowledging, much less embracing or celebrating the level of diversity that we have in the organization. In some ways, even that exploration helps you understand who you are culturally and, and where you may be from an inclusion standpoint. But if you're not honest about where you're beginning, before you go to exploring sort of tailored messaging for an on-campus program, you've got to understand who you are and then really what, what you're looking to do. Um, because I think without the clear goals of what this work intends, I mean, the idea that we just, we want to be more diverse. You know, what does that mean? Exactly what are we talking about? And the willingness to get specific about um, the type of talent that we're looking for and the gaps that we have, I think is something that we do on the business side all the time. We've been reticent to do it in this space. Um, and I think accountability is the third piece of it where we do it all the time, sort of on core business or core metrics, we're reticent to bring accountability into this space. So I think if you're able to sort of get real about who you are and really who you are from a diversity standpoint, where your gaps are, inclusion where your gaps are, have very clear goals and effective measures, not about activity, about results. And then people are held accountable for it. And then you go to, um, okay, attraction, and you can have a discussion around experience hiring strategy and what you may need to do there. Unless you have the clarity before you begin, I think most of the things are, you're gonna come up short. Retention, until you're clear about those things, being able to retain the talent that you want, you're gonna come up short. 
You're not even able to get into the conversation. You don't even have the language to explain why she left. Right? Like, so, you know, she is our fifth black woman this year to leave. Let, you know, we, we can't even have a conversation about it because we don't talk about black women leaving and why. And so I just think it's, there's this foundational piece that I think before you get to those that if you don't have, uh, because again, you can have various different strategies on the others that can be effective depending upon who you are and what you do. But unless you do that initial work, I think in some ways you're going to be hamstrung in terms of ever being successful. I think those comments are spot on. I will say everybody is looking for a quick fix right now. And there are no quick fixes. And uh, again, the conversation that I had yesterday with the industry trade group, we talked about the fact that you've got to really understand that culture to understand where you start. Because if you start trying to put solutions in place that are not going to work with that culture and you haven't changed culture, your programs are going to fail. So it's a constant e evolution that this takes place. And again, one size does not fit all. Um, but I do think it does start with that culture. So Dr. I can make one comment. Okay. I think um, just, you know, as we look at this um, entire diversity and inclusion world that, you know, every time you peel back a layer of the onion, there, there's another one there that you're like, oh, but what about this? And so that's one reason I think today, you know, obviously we're just hitting the high points here, but um, just, you know, in general, I think there's just so much to this. And I think that just, um, you know, hits on exactly what Michael was talking about. And, you know, it's hard work. It, it's really hard work. Again, I'm a, a, a president of, a, of an institution that I was talking to. Um, you know, he talks all the right things and says, we want to do all these wonderful things. But then there's these other other business things that are getting in the way of, of meetings to address it. And, and it's hard. It's because there's no blueprint and there's no one size fits all and there's no silver bullet. So I agree. I agree. Thank you, Amy. And um, the one piece I'll say on that, honestly, is to, and honestly, I think different, different folks have different muscles to do the work. As a white man, my drive to work doesn't help me in this space. But driving black to work every day, experiencing life while black as a woman, there are different people that have done work in this space because of their lived experience. But for many of us that come in, again, as white folk, we haven't done the work around race in a way that most people of color have throughout their lives. And so I do think it is, it is a lot of work. And some of us are differently positioned in that work in terms of having muscles that actually position us because we've been doing it our whole lives because of our lived experience and we're able to bring that into the work context in a way that others of us can't. Thank you, thank you. So, so Dr. Gibson, first of all, thank you for your service. And, and I will say, as we've been putting together this program, getting the opportunity to get to know you has just been delightful. <laughs> so it has been wonderful. You shared with me your story, your career journey to mm -hmm. Hanson University. I'd love if you would share that with the folks that are on a webinar today, talk about what you've personally experienced with companies, why you made decisions to either stay or to leave. Um, what has attracted you? So, you know, when I think about diversity and inclusion, um, I, I had a mentor many years ago who helped me keep it simple. Um, she said, diversity actually gives you a seat at the table. Um, inclusion allows you to dance. And so whether I happen to be the woman who's joining the company, they give me a seat at the table. But as soon as I call in and say my child is ill, they're not going to let me dance and work from home and still do my work. Um, if I happen to be an African-American and they give me a seat at the table, but um, you know, it is the Juneteenth holiday and they say, well, I, I don't know what that holiday is. And so we can't be a part of that. And so I can't dance. And so um, I've looked at diversity and inclusion through that lens, through my journey from Cleveland, Ohio, um, where I was invited to come to the table um, at an all girls boarding school. But then when I got there and I wanted to dance and be like in the top 10 of the students, they were kind of like, well, wait a minute, I, that, that's not normal. But what's, who says what's normal, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I finished that journey in Cleveland, Ohio, and I then attended an all women's college um, at Ursuline College. And then I decided I wanted to go back to school 
Um, but I couldn't dance because I didn't have the money. So I then decided to join the military. And so in the military, I can say that if anybody has got it right, um, companies really should look at that model. Because if you look at the diversity and the rainbow that you see in the military, you see those who um, can come in as a private and they can excel to the top um, of the military company because there are some key ingredients in place. Um, they promote education. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are or what you look like or who you love. They also give you equitable opportunity so you can be a leader and they train you to become a leader. And if you fall down, they pick you back up so that you still are included in becoming a leader. Um, they do a very good job with work-life balance. Um, in the military, you have 30 days of leave. Um, so that promotes that we believe that you can have that balance, whether that family is your spouse, your children, um, your parents. Um, and so when you're in a culture that is promoting leadership, education, work-life balance, you can't help but say, I, I wanna stay here. And so that's why you see people in that military culture who will stay for 20 plus years um, because they are giving back to their country, but because you have a big company um, that promotes diversity and inclusion. So as I left the military, um, I looked for those key ingredients in my jobs. Um, so my very first job out of the military, um, I actually moved to a different state um, and it was Washington State. And so totally different part of the world um, from say maybe being in the South. And so I looked for a company that would allow me to function and use those same assets. Um, and so I found that um, in a, a large company, um, it was actually called MultiCare Health System. And so they had those key ingredients, work-life balance. Do you wanna go back to school? Would you like to do community service? We participate in community service. Um, and they participated in community service that touched all sectors of the community. Um, that health system would be out there when, there, when it was Gay Pride Day. Um, they would be out there when it was Juneteenth. Um, Asian American outreach. Um, so through those lenses, as long as I stayed on purpose with those key ingredients that I started with, um, I was willing to stay and die on the vine for them. Um, and so now um, I want to transfer that legacy um, to young adults who are preparing to go out into the world. And so many times you don't read about diversity and inclusion in a book. Um, so I get to be their book. And so I try to filter in their education as nurses, as gerontologists, what is diversity and inclusion about? How do you prepare yourself to be that marketable person that goes into a company? And you know what? the company that you think might pay you the most money might not be the company that helps you live on purpose. Um, so that's how my life journey has taken me to different places. And, and now I'm trying to transfer that legacy now to students. Well, well, thank you. And a couple of things that you said. First of all, um, I think that the uh, military should hire you as a recruiter. Because <laughs> um, the way you just talked about the 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 company of the military and the support system that they have and the inclusion, I have to be honest with you, I haven't heard a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. So so thank you. And, and you were talking about having a seat at the table reminded me of a quote that I read the other day by Shirley Chisholm. And she said, if you're not given a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair, mm -hmm. uh, which I just thought was the cutest set. I just love that. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for those comments. So Amy, the accounting world has put an awful lot of focus on the attraction, retention, and development of women. And you see lots of sponsorships um, of women's events, particularly the LPGA creeping up. I know that Kiter has done some very, very creative work. I'd like you to talk about that. And I'd like for you to talk about the challenges that you've personally faced, um, the opportunities 
uh, and what you see in the way of growth in your own industry. All right. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, and, you know, the thing I think I would really like to talk about is um, Kiter's reduced hour uh, schedule. And, you know, basically there are several people um, and they just at this point happen to be all women, but could be others um, who are on the reduced hour schedule. And if I can start by telling you a little bit about the process for how um, kind of you get into that. Um, just because I think it's important and it actually hits on another point, Gail, that you had made earlier, which is that, you know, one size does not fit all in this situation. Um, so what you do is um, here we have um, what's called advocates and mentors. And those are people who are, um, you know, at least a level senior to the person and they're kind of their sponsor for helping them with career development and, um, you know, kind of uh, wading through the organization, I'll say. Um, and that's the first step if you are somebody who wants to be on a reduced hour schedule is that, um, you know, you talk to them about what would be a reasonable schedule for both yourself and the organization. Um, and then from there, um, you write up a proposal and um, that's presented to and approved by uh, the department head. Um, you know, I'm in the audit department, so I'm going to give you a few examples of um, specifically, you know, some people and what they've done with that and how that has helped. Um, to retain them. And, and, and honestly, the reason it's helped retain people is because it's the recognition of, as you said earlier, one size does not fit all. And so there are different ways to make this work um, where you can, you know, have the balance that you need in life. And so um, currently, just in uh, the audit department itself, we have a senior manager who um, works a full busy season schedule, which is generally January through March. And um, for people maybe not as familiar with public accounting, a full busy season schedule is more than a full schedule, <laughs> um, especially at that time of year. And then um, in the summer, she works a significantly reduced schedule so that she can spend time with her family. Um, we also have a manager who um, took a 30 day leave of absence. And um, she did that in order to travel Asia with her husband. Um, and then we also have a supervisor who um, had been an employee for many years and um, basically converted from a salaried to an hourly employee so that she can set her schedule based on what her childcare needs are. And so if you look at those three, three things, they're all very different, but they're all under the concept of a reduced hour schedule. Um, so if I take myself then, um, I am the first female audit partner at Kiter um, as of October 1st of 2019, which obviously has been interesting because having your first year as partner in a pandemic, well, that's a little different, isn't it? <laughs> um, and then I'm also the first reduced hour partner. And um, so I have been on reduced hours um, for, since my daughter was born and she's nine. Um, and so you know, when, when the idea came up um, of, you know, what I wanted to do, whether or not I wanted to become a partner, I mean, basically, um, you know, I said I did, but I, I wanted to be a reduced hour partner. And so um, the process that, that Kiter went through was um, to come up with a reduced hour partner role. Um, and then I was considered as the first reduced hour partner. So as part of uh, the partner candidate process, um, it's interesting because, you know, there is there is a process and um, I have been here for, uh, I guess, 11 years at that point. So everybody knew me, um, but but there's a process involved um, for, you know, uh, being becoming a partner. And one of those items that you go through is um, an interview with the executive committee at Kiter. And so um, when I went through my interview, one of the questions they asked me was, you know, why did it take you a little longer? to become a partner candidate than some others. And my answer was simple, and it was that I wanted to be a mom. And that doesn't mean you can't be a good mom working you know, full-time or not reduced hours, but just for me, that wasn't the right fit for me. Back to the one size does not fit all concept, right? And so um, for me, I wasn't, I wasn't in a rush. I wanted to take the time with my daughter. Um, I have only one, so you know, I'm gonna save her every minute. Um, and for me, that worked perfectly. Um, so, so it goes all back to the concept of, I think if, if 
companies can understand that people have different needs as far as life and work and family and things like that, and they can recognize that and somehow acknowledge it, that I think that that really is a great tool for retention. Um, and then I think you had asked me, I believe, um, what's, what's coming around next? Do you, yes? Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I remember the whole question. Um, so one thing that we did try um, this past summer, just with the pandemic, is we tried a virtual internship. And, um, you know, a lot of companies had actually canceled their internships, but we went ahead with ours and just kind of shortened it and did it virtually. Um, and we got rave reviews on it. So I think what's next is that we can use that knowledge that we have now that we can do a virtual internship and we can use that as a, as a um, recruiting tool to recruit from maybe schools that we haven't targeted in the past or, you know, areas of the country that we haven't targeted in the past. Um, things like that where, you know, and, and, and honestly, kind of in the same vein, you know, even just having the flexibility that now people accept remote work more, mm -hmm. that may help us as far as just, you know, retention of maybe we can make different arrangements if, you know, in some circumstances. Um, so I think, I think it's been interesting because, you know, you're layering the, the pandemic environment and the virtual environment with, um, you know, DNI initiatives and, um, in some ways, I think they all kind of fit together and you can use different pieces of different things to kind of, you know, uh, forward, you know, both, I, I guess I'll say both areas. Um, I, I would agree. That you've been working with, yeah. I would agree, thank you. You know, it's interesting you talk about the working remotely and, and I wish I had put this out and, and copied it this morning. I saw a report by an architectural firm um, and who knows, you know, sometimes you can't believe everything you read. So I want to do a little bit more of a deep dive into this. But it said that um, with, with the movement to working remotely, that they had done a survey and 94% of respondents said that they did not want to stay completely remote, which that surprised me that it was that high, which is why I really want to take a look at how they did this survey. But they said that 94% um, said they did not want to stay remote, um, but they wanted some flexibility in it, um, that they really did want to be back in the office one, two, or three days a week. And it talked about the power of people and that connectivity. So it's going to be interesting to see the new world that we come out of uh, and how that's going to change what companies look like and, and, and how they're delivering um, to, their, to their employee base. So, so I'd like to talk a little bit on the topic of unconscious bias and institutional and systemic racism. Um, can, can, I, can, I ask, um, can I just add something before you jump to sure. that? I wanted to just piggyback um, on what Amy talked about how she you know, has reduced hours as a partner because she wanted to relish that role as a young mother. Yep. Um, and I think the other piece with retaining um, qualified, um, diverse talent has to do with those who are in the human resources arm um, to look at the differences in seasons in life. Um, and so her company, um, I applaud them because they saw value in her being a mom um, and stepping back and allowing her to address that. Um, I think that the other way um, you also retain um, quality folks is to look at those who may be um, caring for um, grandchildren or caring for their parents. And many times um, when an employee comes in and they say, well, I'd like to work reduced hours, they become penalized or either they don't feel comfortable speaking up because they feel they won't be able to make partner or even in academia, they won't be able to, you know, make tenure. And so I think that being open 
um, to your employees and being understanding that there will be different seasons in life and that we accept that diversity um, and that we applaud that and we won't penalize you for that. Um, I, I think that that's so important. I, I love that comment. You know, I, I think but very honestly, I wish I were 30 years younger for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is that when I started in business, it was one size fits all. Yeah. And uh, you had to fit into this model, whether you were, regardless of who you were, what you are, what your family circumstance was like, you know, so I, as, as a young mom, you know, had major work-life challenges. But I also think of, you know, other people who, as, as you just said, Ethelyn, who might be caring for elderly parents, mm -hmm. um, you know, or dads who, who are a single dad and the, the things that are going on in their life. We've become more creative. Mm -hmm. um, I think my personal opinion, it was very slow to get to where we are. I think that the new awareness of adaptability can be successful mm -hmm. has come out of, of COVID. At least that's what I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's an interesting way that we're looking at the world today. So, so moving on to um, unconscious bias and systemic and, and uh, institutional racism. It was interesting. I was talking to a CEO the other day and he was telling me that he is absolutely convinced that his company fully embraces everyone, that it is completely inclusive, but they were having problems um, attracting um, a diverse workforce. And I, I know the CEO very well and, and have a tremendous amount of respect for him, but I did challenge him. And, and what I said was that in every company that I've ever worked for, I can pinpoint specific incidents of unconscious bias or institutional and systemic racism. And um, that it's not necessarily that people are bad, it's just that the culture that they've grown up in, they aren't thinking of these things all the time. So we hear so much about unconscious bias, institutional and systemic racism. Um, I'd like to kind of start with the definition of what these are to each of you. So, um, Ethelyn, how about you go first? Okay. Well, I, I think that the definition actually comes from the C-suite. And so if you look at each of your organizations, you can easily define what is institutional and structural racism by simply looking at the people who are sitting in the seats at the top. And so if everybody's sitting in the seats at the top are white men who are over the age of 40, your definitions are going to be quite different if you have a mix of culture, men, women, you know, mothers, grandmothers, um, you know, community members, um, because if I'm sitting in the C-suite, um, I'm going to look through a totally different lens um, as to whether my institution, say of the, of the college, supports um, part-time work. Um, because many colleges say that you can only be a professor um, if you are full-time. So if I say that well, I can't support that, that's institutional racism to a level. Um, what is structural? Structural means that I say you can work remotely, but I'm actually calling you and I want you to be on your computer. And so actually structurally, I'm being very racist in my thought. And then lastly, if I think about, you know, um, what, you know, is that sensitivity again? I, I got to look at the leadership at the top. And, and if I don't start at that leadership at the top, mirroring the people that I want to bring up to the top, um, then there's a barrier. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Amy, what would you like to add to that? Well, I have a little bit more of a simplistic viewpoint, although, you know, Dr. Gibson has some 
actually very uh, interesting points that make me think a lot, I have to say. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, but my more simplistic um, thought was just, you know, there are certain biases that we all have. And that if you look at unconscious bias, I mean, what is unconscious, right? You don't know you have them, right? So, so th that's kind of, that's kind of my take on it is finding out what your own biases are so that you as an individual can kind of recognize that. And then, you know, it, at least, uh, I don't know, I think a big part of it is just recognizing that you actually do have these biases because then you can, you know, modify like, oh man, maybe I did that because I was thinking this way or, and, and it kind of helps to frame, you know, your actions and your words and things like that. Um, I will say that I was a part of a group um, called uh, Women in m and um, And as part of one of the meetings that we had, we did like a pre-exercise that was, I believe it was like a Harvard um, unconscious bias exercise where you look at different pictures and they have the words, yeah. <laughs> yep. um, and I did that and honestly, I was surprised at some of the biases that I had. I mean, I, I had no idea. And mm -hmm. so to me, like just, if an individual can, can figure that out to start with, I think that's like a great starting point because then at least like you can understand yourself better. And I think that that helps with just, you know, the conversations, um, you know, like we're having today and just, you know, understanding the perspective of other people. You know, I, I love those comments. Um, and one of my favorite stories, and, and anybody on the, on the, that's listening on the webinar who is a close friend of mine has probably heard the story before, so I apologize. But a couple of years ago, I was fortunate to attend um, a dinner hosted by Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. And um, they were um, given questions in advance. Uh, they did take questions from the floor, but they were given questions in advance. And the very first question that was given to Justice Sotomayor was um, what did it feel like to be the first Hispanic female on the Supreme Court? And um, she sat there and she sat up so straight and, and she looked at everybody and she said, first of all, let's recognize that you've just labeled me by asking me about being a Hispanic female. And she said, and when you've labeled me, you have missed everything else that I am. You have missed the fact that I am a very talented um, uh, legal mind. You've missed the fact that I have been involved in all these things outside of my profession. You miss the fact that I participate in this, that I do this, that I'm a, you know, that this is who else I am because you've put me into this bucket. And she said, but I do think it's important to recognize how we do that and how we think about people and that we recognize our own biases. And then she went on to share some of her life experiences and how they have shaped her and how she has worked to understand those perceptions to become a better person. So I think that's a lot of what you are saying, Amy. So thank you for that. Michael, I'd love to hear what you have to add to that. So um, I probably, somewhere in the middle, again, in some ways I almost think of as two houses, the bias and sort of the racism, systemic racism. Again, as Amy was pointing out, I think for me, bias is, it is, um, Everyone has them, everyone. It's sort of, it's the way the mind has developed over many, many years from when we lived in caves and why we, we don't now. And so there's some that have, you know, things like, you know, an overconfidence bias or a confirmation bias, right? We have an idea and then we, our mind is naturally drawn towards information that confirms a pre-existing understanding. It's a conservative bias that we tend to, as our minds rely upon prior evidence as opposed to new evidence more likely. Um, affinity bias is then gets us into this notion that we tend to have preferences for those that look like us or have shared experiences with us. So there's all of these, the wirings of the brain is how I think about it, that everyone has that informs how we play out in everything and work and in our lives. And that's, so again, and, and, and there are, you know, not dozens, but many biases, right? And when you understand the different bias for you know, not being overconfident or not look, not uh, you know, the confirmation bias issue and, and then affirmation bias. And again, the Harvard implicit bias test thing is talking about is a great one to help you understand in some ways, largely the bucket of affinity bias and sort of whether we have preferences for 
um, for certain people based on race, ethnicity, gender, LGBT status. So, so, so that's all. So to me, it, there's, and there's a lot there to sort of deconstruct or understand about okay, how, our, how our mind shows up. And then you go to the other house, so again, the, the racism, which again, simply, I would say, is in systemic racism, and it's systems of advantage or disadvantage based on race. Mm -hmm. Systems of advantage or disadvantage based on race. Um, with race as a construct that was created by uh, for whites to preserve power and a status quo. And I think that when you, and I think in the past, companies, I would say for profit companies, have been comfortable engaging in the bias exploration because, again, affinity bias and those biases show up in how we operate. I think where we've been reticent to get involved is this idea of addressing systemic racism. Um, and that any institution in America um, is prone to white supremacy, white centrality. It is, in many different ways, an institution to preserve advantages and different advantages based on race. And without work to deconstruct that, you have systemic racism, you have persistent racism, you have advantages that, and disadvantages that are played out over time based on race. So that's how I think about them and why I see them as such separate houses, because again, we all operate in the house of bias, everyone. Right. Um, we all also, we all, and, 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 and equally, right? And equally, right? And it's these are so again, we all have the affinity bias and the, and the, the overconfidence bias that, that, that cuts across all of our differences. When you go into the house of racism, we are not equally situated. And the whole point is that it sets up a different structure that disadvantages some over others. Um, and so, it, so it's a very different, I think, um, they're very different houses to navigate, but to recognize that we operate in both. So Michael, Altria, um, huge company, lots of good work mm -hmm. um, that takes place uh, in the company. How does leadership hold people accountable to addressing this and moving forward in the constructive manner that's necessary? Right. So I think, and, and I do think the past few months have been a watershed moment for us. And in some ways, this, this conversation is perfectly timed. And then it's also just like one week too soon, because on Monday, me and the CEO were going back to the entire organization to talk about the additional work that we're doing to address the experience of Black employees at the company, where I think we have moved from, as most organizations have, I think, traditionally doing bias training and unconscious bias and so into a race of addressing racism and addressing systemic racism. And so I think we'll be announcing actually this afternoon to our officers and then on Monday to the organization, the work that we're doing to sort of address, address all of it. And I think embedded in that is a, um, I think is greater clarity on what accountability looks like. So in the past, um, how you operated um, was, was factored in but not as explicit as many had wanted and not as consistent, I think, as everybody needed. And so I can reflect on my early career where the results that I delivered um, were largely, well, not, I mean, that's really what was looked to. And we talked about the need to be inclusive and we talked about the need for diversity. But um, in terms of my performance and sort of how I was viewed as a leader or a contributor, it skewed heavily into that result. And what we are looking at, I think now bringing forward is, again, um, um, transparency and metrics and ways to say, um, you are not a good leader because you don't know how to lead a diverse organization, right? And have in, in place a recognition, a, you know, a, a truth that if you don't know how to lead an organization of women, an organization of women of color, you don't, you're not a good leader. It's, and then having ways to measure that and hold leaders accountable, reward those that do it well, and let those that are not understand that um, that, that matters as well and have a way in, in place to do that. Well, Michael, uh, I'm going to circle back with you after these meetings and uh, follow up with that to find out a little bit more details on what it is that you're rolling out. It sounds like you've got some very good work that, that you're gonna be communicating over the next few days. Ethelyn, last week when we spoke, you talked about um, what colleges and universities are doing with their students mm -hmm. to help them deal with these challenges, particularly as they go out into the real world and start applying for jobs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Because I found that absolutely fascinating. 
Yes, um, I, I must applaud um, my former um, employer before I came to Hampton University, um, so Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, for the last, I want to say seven years now, um, they actually have an arm that is called the Institute of Inclusion, Inquiry, and Innovation. Um, and it is under the Senior um, Vice President for Diversity. And so um, the brainchild is that we um, want to immerse diversity and inclusion in all the schools, whether it's nursing, business, engineering. How do we help our students truly see what is implicit bias when you're out there in the community? How do you come to understand your own implicit bias? And then how do you begin to build your own tools so that when you're going out for the job interview, when you are out working with other students. So um, they asked us to develop a pop-up course. And so the name of the pop-up course, and you probably heard of the pop-up intention, um, is just pull it together. And it was called Whose Lives Matter? Not any particular lives, but Whose Lives Matter? And so um, the students' um, classes were held over three weeks in three different locations. The first location was at the, but the Greyhound bus station because you would be amazed as if, if you sit in the corner of the bus station, who do you see coming in to catch the bus? You see mothers with children. You might see people using it because it's a homeless shelter. Um, and you start thinking, as you look at all these different people in the bus station, I, I never thought that I looked at those people in that way. Um, the second class is then held in the resource room, which is really the fancy term for the conference room in the middle of the public housing projects. And so first of all, the students were like, well, is it safe for us to, to come to, you know, the public housing projects? Where should we park? Um, will it be okay? So they were starting to check themselves with some of the things that they had grown up with. And then the very last place that we held um, the class was in the middle of the playground. And so everybody says, it, it, you know, if you can't play in the sandbox together, you can't play anywhere. And mm -hmm. so Whose Lives Matter actually is helping students to look at the terms of implicit bias, structural racism, institutional racism, in a real world context. And those students left thinking, uh, you know, I I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned a lot about my community. And so we thought it was just gonna be a one time, um, but students are like, um, well, is that course being offered again? Um, and so now it is being offered for credit where before students came without it even being offered for credit, but it was very valuable because we immerse them in an area where it made them stop and think. I love it. You know, I think for everybody to understand that everybody has a story. And uh, so often we bring our stories to the table and unconsciously think everybody else probably had the same experiences or had that same perspective. Um, you know, one of the people that worked for me that I just absolutely adored um, years ago, she would say, you know, seek to understand before being understood. And what I found whenever there was a conflict, always starting with that question, which is, so tell me your perspective on this situation or tell me a little bit more about what happened because I would think I understood because they were from my eyes and my experiences. So um, I absolutely know it's fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, Amy, what about the accounting world and what you've seen um, as far as how leadership is dealing with getting people to look through different lenses? Um, well, I've seen a few different things. Um, one thing that we do um, here at Kiter is we work with the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities. Um, and we've done some DNI trainings through them, um, which has been you know, very interesting. And this year in particular, just uh, I think next week, we have a training for those specifically involved in our recruiting program. Um, and the um, VCIC is putting together a program for us to uh, look specifically at that area um, for those involved in recruiting to kind of, you know, help us, you know, see 
whatever it is that we're not seeing, once again, back to the un unconscious bias um, idea. And so, um, so I think those have been, been, you know, pretty eye opening. And, and like I was saying before, I think that just starting at the individual level with understanding yourself, I mean, I think that's like a great place to start. Um, so um, I think that's relatively effective. Um, the other thing that we've had here um, is we have different um, discussion channels or groups, and this is a relatively new thing that we've been doing. Um, one of them, for example, is um, called parenting support. So um, basically, it's just, you know, groups of people who are kind of similarly, similarly situated, um, you know, and can kind of bounce things off of each other, um, you know, talk about, you know, issues that they're having, get ideas and things like that. I know we've also talked about um, having like a women's uh, channel as well as some others. Um, and then, you know, one thing that we're just rolling out, um, which, you know, all this, it's funny, you know, Michael said it's very timely and it really is for us as well. Um, because one thing also that we're rolling out is um, I had talked a little bit um, in the first question that you had asked about the advocate and mentor program which is basically like a sponsor, you know, for some, for um, everybody. And it's somebody who's basically like a level ahead of you to help you kind of navigate your career and things like that. Well, we're, we're tweaking that and we're rolling out um, a new, what we're calling a coaching program. Um, because traditionally what we've done is with our advocate program, particularly is that as soon as somebody was promoted to the level of supervisor, they automatically became an advocate and got advisees. But, you know, as we talk about diversity, you know, people have different strengths and weaknesses and you need all of all of the different attributes and all of the different focus areas, but you don't need everybody to have every single one of them. And so what we kind of realized through this process um, is that people are mo more motivated at work um, and uh, more effective if they can kind of play to their strengths or at least to areas that they're interested in. And so, you know, you may have somebody who like, they love doing tax returns, right? And they are like so good at doing tax returns. They're good at figuring out tax planning, you know, that's like their strength, right? But then you may have somebody else who they're a great coach of people. So, you know, if somebody is not motivated by coaching people and they're more motivated by doing tax returns, we're trying to get them into the right spot and basically match their strengths with, and their motivation, you know, what motivates them um, with what they're actually doing on the job. And so we're kind of in the middle of rolling that out right now, like I was saying, um, but, but back to the main idea is that, you know, if people can be their authentic selves, they're going to do their best work. And that's kind of what this coaching um, rollout relates to is, okay, let's let people, instead of trying to, you know, put the, the round peg in the square hole every day, let's, let's really, you know, work with what people are good at and what motivates them and let's get them to do that. And then the other people that are good at the other stuff, they can do that. So that's kind of the idea, um, obviously very simplified, but those are a few things that, that I've seen um, both in the industry and at Kiter. Well, what I really enjoy hearing is the fact that that business um, is trying, trying different things. And I think, Michael, you had said earlier that these last couple of months have kind of sped up that conversation. Um, we've got to start, we really have to start doing something as opposed to just talking about it. Um, so as we close in on the hour, the one thing that I'm going to ask everybody who's on the phone or in the webinar is, I really hope, you know, this is the third of the, of the series that we've had. And we've talked about how do you talk about it honestly. We've talked about culture. We've talked about um, building that, that workforce. Um, we all see things every day that need to be corrected. Um, and, and I'm just going to ask people to, to really pay attention to those things and, and make the statements that need to be made. Um, the right way so that they're heard, but, but make them be heard. Um, you know, for businesses, we're going through a transformation right now. And I think that all of us as consumers um, need to look at who we're doing business 
and how those businesses are reacting to the world and to these pressures. And if they're being blind to it, personally, I'm not gonna tell anybody what to do, but I think we need to let them know that maybe we're not gonna be doing business there. Um, you know, there are terrific movements and changes that have taken place when people have said, you've got to do better and it's got to stop just being lip service. And I'd like to see us start moving more towards that. So as we wrap up, um, Ethelyn, Amy, Michael, any last comments that you might have? Um, you know, th this is Ethelyn. I, I just think that being open um, to the conversation and being patient with each other as you have the conversation, because I, I'm no expert in the area. And then maybe my other colleague who might have you know, exhibited implicit bias, I must have patience with them as they learn. Um, but as long as their heart is open, that's all that matters. Wonderful comment. Amy, Michael, anything else? I was just going to say that, you know, your comment, Gail, on, you know, if you see something, you know, say something type of thing. You know, I think that that just goes back to, you know, just understanding your own views and how you might see things differently than other people just based on your own life experience. And, you know, I think just understanding that so that you can do exactly as you said and, you know, kind of understand, um, you know, where others are coming from as well. I think that's all really important in this whole, um, you know, area. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Agreed, Amy. I just to build on uh, Dr. Gibson's point, um, because I'm not a patient person, and so, you know, for me, it has been a personal struggle as well to, to find the patients um, for the work and sort of how, you know, and, and, the, and the time that some of this takes, and it's sort of trying to find the right space to be able to lean into the work and move the work forward um, with just a, an honest understanding of, of, of how long some, some things take. Um, and then just carrying with that and holding with that the grace that is necessary in, the, in this work um, uh, for all the reasons I think that, that you know. So I think it's, uh, it really is just trying to kind of hold those things, both uh, um, the patience for how long it, it takes, um, the commitment and the leaning in and the push to make it happen and the grace that you need to um, so would that we would we make mistakes, um, and when that others show us the same grace that we're able to show them when you know when they misstep or so. Well, I will say I love the word grace, and and I think if we all embraced it, we'd be such a better world. Um, and I do think that that is how you you effectuate change. So, to the three of you, Dr. Gibson, Amy, Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, loved having this chat with you. Loved your comments, your insights. Um, love your commitments. Um, to our webinar participants, I hope that you found today insightful and interesting. We do record this. It will be posted um, by the end of the week on the Let's Consult LinkedIn page. Um, please feel free to share that with anybody. Um, but I really enjoyed having all of you with us today. So I wish everybody an absolutely fabulous day and please stay healthy. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye everybody. Thank you.